Hi, and welcome to this episode of Chess for Life in the Time of Corona. This episode, we are delighted to welcome Sean Marsh. Uh, Sean has been teaching chess in schools for over 30 years. He has been teaching chess in Teesside since 1988 and has been part of the Chess in Schools and Communities program since 2010. Sean also does some work for the ECF and he's on the ECF's Book of the Year panel. Um, as well as that, he's also a strong player and won 15 out of 15 in his local league recently. Sean, welcome to the program. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to your program. Thank you. And Sean, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into chess? I certainly can. Um, I first got into chess in the wake of the very famous 1972 Fischer-Spassky match and believe it or not chess became quite popular for some time after that and chess sets were in every shop apparently and Christmas 1972 my parents bought me my first ever chess set and I was able to practice against my two brothers who uh, they could both play a little bit and I just kept practicing and practicing against them until I was able to beat them and they tended to lose interest a little bit, but I just kept going and it became a really fascination for me. Um, all the way through my school years, I was playing more chess than doing anything else. A familiar story. <laughs> <laughs> and this continued into my college years and and that's that's how I got started with the chess. Yeah. And and how did you get into chess teaching? Chess teaching. <laughs> This is going back a long time, this is going back 32 years of course. Uh, when you leave school or college in the mid-1980s, it's it's a bit of a different environment than, than at other times. And it was a very, very black time around the world, a very black time in this country especially. I'm not a political person, so I'm not going to go down that route. Uh, but it was very, very difficult to get any normal kind of work. But the only thing I could do was, was play chess and communicate ideas about chess. So I decided to start my own business teaching chess in schools, which is outrageous because no one had ever done that. I had nothing to go by. It was a yeah. big decision to make. Uh, I didn't go down a normal going to university route, which is the most common route somewhere in my age then. And I just contacted local schools to see if anyone was interested. And surprisingly one or two were. And it's been obviously peaked in troughs ever since. Well, you were probably one of the pioneers, weren't you, for um, for, for ch teaching chess in schools? I think because uh, 1988. I mean, that's that, that you know that's that's really uh, you must have been one of the first. I believe so. I think people may have done it to some extent, maybe in chess clubs with juniors and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But once you go into schools, yeah, it was lunchtime and after school clubs, of course, um, rather than after school, uh, rather than curriculum time, which is what we do with CSC. Uh, so it was a very, very strange thing, and I had to build my confidence, and it was very difficult. I was never very good contacting people on the phone and things like this. I had to build up my confidence with that sort of technique. Very shy person, I suppose. And then teach myself how to teach. I had no form of uh, teacher training whatsoever. I just went into a school and, and made things up until I got it right. I'm still, I'm still working on that. <laughs> it's obviously an evolving, an evolving project. So what do you prefer? Uh, what sort of age do you prefer to teach? And large groups or small groups? Or uh, what are your techniques? <laughs> anything. You give me anything and I've, I've seen something similar before. So I will work with year ones. I will work with year sixes. That's the whole primary range, of course. I'll work with secondary children. I'll work with adults. I'll work with anybody. I spent some years before uh, teaching blind players. Oh, really? And so I think, yes, we have, we have get-togethers every year with the uh, Braille Chess Association. They invited me down to spend time with their players. And also here on Teesside, we had a, a blind uh, chess club as well. And then particular techniques again, um, also with, when people are blind, often they have hearing difficulties as well. So I had to work out my own technique to overcome those uh, potential obstacles. But fascinating, fascinating work. And now, you know, as you know, class sizes are enormous. You could have a class of 35 children, 36 mm -hmm. children. And that requires lots of different techniques to teach you one to one. Very obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, discipline it's, yeah. it's it's a big big problem. You would never ever walk into a classroom and find the ideal class. It's it's just impossible. It's a, it's a it's a dream. And you'll always find the the standard issues. Um, issues are magnified the the more. 
the number builds in a class. I mean, 35 is an enormous amount of people to keep control of. It really is. Yeah, yeah. Good teachers can make that look easy, um, but it's not easy and it never will be easy. So yeah, I think I, I tried once with a class. That we had a chess club uh, where I was saying it with about 20. And they'd listen to me for a tiny bit, but mostly they just wanted to get on and play against each other. So that's what we did in the end. We just had a, a short session of learning at the start and then and then lots and lots of games. And then you've got, can I go to the toilet every two seconds? And Oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, someone's <laughs> agitating somebody else. They're carrying this over from a lunchtime battle or something and... This is not just chess. Well, they can get very upset if they lose. Yeah. They can get very upset if they lose, especially the teachers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and so your own play, have you managed to find the time to keep that going over the years? Um, to some extent. I was very, very active uh, before I started teaching in schools. I played lots and lots of local tournaments and go further afield. Um, you know, Leeds, London, Hope, the whole lot. As many tournaments as I could, I was absolutely obsessed with with playing and getting better. And every now and then, I had to take a little break from from playing because the work increases and there's so much to do. So twice I've taken ten years out from from the local chess scene, and you know it's it's accumulates lots of rust when when you don't play for a while, and it takes three or four years to get that rust away. To be honest with you, so I don't have time to prepare my games. I shouldn't no. perhaps be telling you this. <laughs> And I'm relying on what Bob Vinnick used to call old research fat when he was uh, in semi-retirement almost. And it's trying to remember things from years ago and hope they've not been refuted. Yeah. Well, I find it easier sometimes to remember the things from my teens um, that I used to know well, well than, than things that I've learned much more recently. It doesn't stick in the mind so much, does it, somehow? Somehow, yeah. <laughs> As you get older, there's, there's so many more things uh, demanding your time and attention. Uh, real life, for example, tends to get in the way of, of chess to some extent, which is very unfortunate. Uh, but it tends to push out any any chess knowledge. You could spend ages looking at a book or a DVD the night before a game, and then you go and play a game, and it's, it's just not there. It's just not in the head anymore. So you have to rely on the on the old the old research and hope that's that's still in there somewhere. Yeah. So, okay, at the moment, uh, it's the 12th of April today. We're actually talking on Easter Sunday, um, and the UK is in lockdown. What is the mood in Teesside at the moment? In Teesside, it's the same as pretty much everywhere else. Uh, uh, I myself didn't become as serious as this, I must admit, and I think a lot of people felt exactly the same, that we as a country could be better prepared, perhaps, than in other places and other places weren't doing things properly and up until what six seven weeks ago I think most people probably felt that way that it was going to come and go and, and not cause um, too many problems generally speaking but it's been a big eye-opener I must say to, to lots and lots of people and the very fact you can pop to the shop and you've got a queue for, for a very long time um, distance queuing and things like this and you look outside, there's not many people out there, there's no traffic, yeah. no planes flying above. It's all, all a big shock, isn't it? It is a big shock, and we've never seen anything like this before, of course. Um, even in a wartime, mm. which we've not had in our lifetime, but in a serious war, you could still get together with your friends mm. and just run when the area side went off, etc. But, but this, this has never been seen before. It's a very, very strange problem indeed. Mm. And how are you finding, are you managing to get any of your chess teaching done at the moment, or do you have any plans? We've got big plans at CSC. We're working on lots of different online delivery methods, and hopefully we can pick up students as well using online delivery methods, such as Skype as we're using now. Zoom is very popular. But it's a big shock. I'm, personally, I'm on a very, very, very steep learning curve because teaching yeah. online is going to be very, very different to yeah. being in the classroom and physical presence and the yeah. connection you have with, with people. Yeah. I must say I'm missing all of my students tremendously. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a big, big problem. So I want to be with them. I feel I belong in front of a class, uh, mm -hmm. teaching my students how to teach, uh, learn chess, um, help them with other things too, and just connect with, with the people. Yeah, You're not yeah. going to get over screen to, to the great extent, uh, but we are on a very steep learning curve. Um, two days ago, I spent a long time recording YouTube videos, which are hopefully going to go out soon. Oh, great. And you probably know yourself, if you're doing um, a video that could be eight minutes long, yeah. You've had several retakes already, you've got to yeah, watch yeah. that, make sure you've not blundered on the, on the words. And you think, oh, I can do eight videos in a day, that's fine, but it's 
that's a, a long day. Yeah, long yeah, day, yeah. And they're trying to get those right. But my technique will hopefully evolve over time and, and I'll get better at doing those things. The skills we're accruing now will be standing us on in very good stead in the future, of course. It's not just for this time. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, so it's, it's all good stuff. Maybe we should have been doing these things years ago. Well, it, uh, it does, uh, it does kind of prompt us to get, get things set up like that. Because it is useful that like, if, if someone was, was off sick or something like that to have some kind of resources um, just in, in normal times. Um, or, or they couldn't be at school for a certain reason, and, uh, then it's nice to have some online content there uh, that they can look at. But what I'm finding actually at the moment, there's a lot of uh, chess you can watch at the moment online, even even though the, the tournaments aren't going, so that's that's quite nice. People are getting very creative, aren't they? I've seen yeah. some displays online and things like this, and people are making a big, big effort to keep things going. And on that point, actually, it's, it, one fascinating thing is, I mean, I don't believe many people are home tutoring now to the extent that we're in the first couple of weeks where they had a time to the children and, and all this sort of thing. It's a noble idea, but it's not practical, and we have to be practical in, in these times. One thing that's really struck me is that the advice from everywhere now is to do all the creative things. Yeah. yeah. Learn in your garden. Definitely. Build yeah. a spot in your house, improvise, play chess, yeah. print things, draw things, paint things. Mm. Strangely enough, all the things that are being forced out of the normal school curriculum. Yeah. Interesting yeah. you say that, yes. Yeah. Maybe that's a little bit of food for thought. Yes, food for thought. My daughters were, were, were cooking muffins at 3 a.m. the other day. I, I came down, I came. I thought they'd gone to bed, and I came down at breakfast time and there was a whole uh, whole plate of muffins there. On the top. <laughs> Are they still there now? And no, they went very quickly, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, we are eating a lot at the moment. Oh, that's just another thing. Yes, yeah, indeed, yeah. yes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, and so so um, we've asked you to select one game uh, to go through. What game have you selected, and why? Uh, I've selected a game. My first win against a grandmaster. Uh, Please and people who became grandmasters after that, but this was a very big moment for me. It was at the Red Card Chess Congress in the year two thousand, and it was against international grandmaster Keith Arkell. Oh, fantastic! Well, known to some of our viewers. <laughs> it may well be known. Um, there's a bit of history with this chess tournament itself. This was the first weekend tournament I ever played in, and it was the first Red Cat Congress back in 1980 something, 1981, I believe. And this was the 20th edition of this congress. And as it was my first tournament, the Red Cat Congress, I wanted to this congress one year. Mm. And in the very first one I played in, I was, I was still a junior. I won my first game on Friday night, and I thought, well, this is going to be easy now. Lost three in a row, won my last one, two out of five, which became the normal score as I moved up the levels into the open section eventually. But I could never quite win the tournaments. I was second, I was third, I was everything in between. And I wanted to win this tournament just once. And this game helped me win this tournament 20 years after first playing in it. Oh, so wow. A very important game for you. When the children at school lose a game in the UK Chess Challenge, which of course is a fantastic tournament, or in their local school tournament or whatever, and they say, look, I wanted to win this tournament, and I tell them the story about how it took me 20 years to win something. And I say to them, imagine when you're 30 years old, finally winning this tournament. <laughs> That's what dedication and commitment is, is all about. And, and the, the, it puts things into a little bit of context for them, because they can win the next tournament, but it took yeah. me 20 years to win this one. Oh. All right, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for, for talking to us, Sean, and we will now move on to the game. Thank you. Okay, so here we are for the game Sean Marsh against Grandmaster Keith Arkell from the Red Car Open 2000. And uh, I've had a sneak preview of it, and it's a really great game, actually. So uh, take it away, Sean. Thank you. <clears throat> Around about this time, I was playing mainly uh, call systems and tour attacks and things like this as white. Obviously, knight f3, bishop g5 to follow as a sort of a fix all for a lack of a repertoire because I've not been playing uh, at all very much. Just the occasional congress, in fact, including this one. Okay. Yeah. I kept playing in this congress because I became the only player ever to play in all of the record congresses, which uh, was a nice little record as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I was desperate to try and win this. In the previous round, on the Friday night, I had a very, very long battle um, with Eddie Herbitz, who's a well-known uh, player from the Yorkshire region, and it took me all night to, to win that game. It was very, very difficult. 
So you were over the venue the next morning um, to find out who you're playing. And of course, I'm playing in round number two against Grandmaster Keith Arkell. Indeed. Uh, so my dreams of winning the tournament. Maybe not what you want for a Saturday night. <laughs> but I decided to abandon the Queen's Pond systems. I mean, they weren't as popular then as they are now. Everyone's playing London systems and things now, of course. Uh, but they were, they were interesting openings at the time. I decided to play them in line, so at least to learn something um, about about one of my old openings rather than just fudge the issue. So I went down the, the classical um, system of D4, C4 on this one. Yeah, this is the, the system that uh, that I always used to play with um, with White. So um, uh, nice to see the Rubinstein variation. Yes, and specifically it becomes, of course, the Samish variation very, very soon. And a long time ago, before chess videos were invented, we had this thing called Audio Chess by Mike Bassman. Oh, yes. Mike Bassman had a full catalogue of audio tapes. You could put your headphones on, you could listen to some chess secrets from the Masters. And my favourite one of all of those was the two uh, cassette, I've never said this there, two cassette repertoire for the D4 C4 player by Raymond Keane. And I think it's a point worth making that Raymond Keane gets a lot of stick in the popular press these days for various reasons. But when it comes to purely teaching chess and presenting chess material, I've always had the greatest respect for Raymond Keane. Yeah. And in fact, Ray has been very kind to me over the years. He's granted me lots of interviews when he didn't have to do and things like this. He's always been available um, to, to be helpful. And on the cassettes, he didn't recommend the same variation against the Nimsu Indian, which we'll see in a moment. But he did recommend it in one of his books on D4C4. And the first time I saw this particular line, even before that book came out, there was a, a chess newspaper in the early 1980s called Chess Express. Which came out oh, yes. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Do you, do you remember that magazine? I remember it, yeah. Great magazine, great magazine, yeah. It, it, it was short-lived. I think they, it didn't fund itself to the extent they wanted to, but Ray Keane had a, had a column in there. So every two weeks I'd read Ray Keane's opening notes. And in this particular column, he recommended the same variation against the Nimizu Indian. And he had some fantastic games, um, Bronstein against um, all sorts of people. Bronstein against Nidorf, I think, was one of the key games where the F-pawn just flew at the board and destroyed everything in its path. And I thought, well, that's, that looks quite interesting, because I wasn't too convinced with the lines I'd given on the cassette. They were a bit uh, deep. Uh, the Hubner variation was a bit of a problem for our white players at the time. But the, the same which was very forcing, and I like the idea of this big pawn roller in the, in the style of, of Bopinik, and that's, that's, I had great success with the, the same which variation. And I still play uh, to this day. Yeah, yeah, I'm it's just... With, it's, it's funny you should say that because um, uh, Ray Keane's book, I think it was uh, an attacking opening repertoire for White with 1D4. That was um, when I was yeah. uh, when I was uh, 13, 14. That was um, uh, kind of when I started getting into opening theory because actually I only played uh, the London system um, um, up till then, uh, with, actually with quite a bit of success. But uh, but that's when I started getting into opening theory. And uh, yeah, I mean, I took up um, these E3 systems and Samish type systems uh, actually because of that book of Ray's. So um, yeah, it's had a very big influence on uh, on me as well. It, it is actually an excellent book. Also, the Samish with Bishop G5 against the King's Indian has been my long-term favourite, and that was straight from the audio chess cassette tapes, uh, which has been one of my biggest point scorers, the Bishop G5 against the King's Indian. Ooh, one of my, one of my favourites too as well. So um, I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't realised that was recommended in, the, uh, in those audio cassettes. My goodness. Absolutely. Yes, and also against all of the Benodis uh, as, a, as a fix all. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So did you play uh, Bishop D3 first, and now A3? Yes, yeah, so it's transposed to the, the same variation. I mean, these days I just play A3 on move four and, and get it over and done <laughs> get with. Get it over and done with, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the older you get, you realise there's no time to mess around with these <laughs> <it> is. <laughs> so, the theme of this, obviously, white's pawns are a little bit compromised, and black's going to apply lots of pressure to the pawn on C4 which is doubled, and because it's doubled and it's the, the first of the two doubled pawns, it's hard to protect that pawn sufficiently, and quite often in this variation that pawn drops off, and what White has to do is get enough play going on the king's side to justify losing that pawn. But of course White's got the two bishops and the potential pawn roller, good chances to attack. I was happy at this point. Yeah, no, it's... Um, uh, ah, okay, so Keith played um, bishop b7 here just to, uh, uh, just to force uh, f3 out of you. 
And uh, did you play some? Did you play in a different style in any way because you were playing Keith, or were you playing basically your normal game? I was playing what I would normally play a few years before this, but because I had very little study time around 2000, uh, because my work was increasing around the schools, that's why I tended to play D4 systems, but this mm. particular opening was still in my repertoire, uh, but I didn't have time to keep up to date with opening developments. So I thought I might as well give this a try, because it does give attacking chances, and even if I lost, I'd learn something about maybe the strategic downfalls of the, the system. Yeah. Yeah, so, so knight c6, knight e2, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Keith went right for your c4 pawn, didn't he? He didn't uh, didn't hang around on that one. <laughs> He's not messing around, and you can suddenly see rook c8 is come in, followed by maybe a swap on d4 to open up the rook against the c pawn. Bishop a6 is come in. I mean, you can probably see even now that that pawn is going to go, the c4 pawn is going to drop. It depends what I can get going in the meantime. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, it, it's uh, actually you know, this game is a, is a really it's a really lovely um, uh, thematic game actually because uh, it's true you just um, this uh, this uh, this sea pawn you're just going to give it away and then just uh, well get the rest of uh, of your position going. So it's uh, and actually this is um, this is a very interesting line from Keith. I mean it's actually quite quite it's very principled and uh, and actually quite crucial for um you know for the variation because um yeah you're just going directly for the sea pool and asking white what uh, what white has got so uh it's pretty cool pretty cool so um and i think ray Keen, sorry in ray Keen's article he did describe this as a gambit this this whole opening for white which yeah. is interesting because obviously we associate gambits mainly with aggressive things like King's Gambit, Evans Gambit, but to call this a Gambit variation, because it is, we're losing the sea pawn. Yeah. So White has to attack. That's a very nice that's a very nice point actually. It's probably and probably mentally it just puts you gives you the right context for how you should play this. You know, uh, if if you if you know it's a gambit, you're never gonna try and uh, keep your uh, sea pawn with moves like Queen A four or anything. You're just going to uh, yeah, you are just, just gonna gonna go for the attack like you should. So Bishop G five Bishop G5 to provoke a weakness on the king side. Of course, I'm going to attack on the king side. So any little pawn move over there by black is going to give me a target. I'm pressing in uh, pawn to E5 in certain lines, uh, but it's just a nice move to play. So H6 and Bishop F6. This is a this is an interesting one. Yes. Did Did you think about playing Bishop H4? Actually, uh, was that uh, because this is kind of possible too, I guess. Bishop h4. If I was to play this game today, I would probably play bishop h4 or, or something like that. I think one of my concerns, if I drop the bishop back to a normal square, for example, e3, which is normal in this system, or sometimes it goes to b2, Yeah. I think I was very conscious of, of the, when the knight takes on c4, it's hitting the bishop automatically. Yeah. yeah. I didn't necessarily want to trade my, my d3 bishop. And bishop h4 is quite normal. I think I was playing for the tempo rather than to keep the bishop pair. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a bit odd, actually. Yeah, yeah no, it's, but it's actually, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting, it's really very interesting, actually. It's, uh, it's not at all a move that, um, that would occur to me as the, you know, as, as the first reaction. But, um, yeah, you know, looking at it more and more, you sort of think, well, actually, that tempo is really, really important. Of course, the queen's going to get a bit in the way of, um, of your, of your kingside pawns once they get going. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting move, actually. That's, um, uh, so queen takes f6, rook c1, just, uh, holding that c4 pawn for now. It's, it's always very nice, actually, isn't it? To, um, um, to make sure that black has to make a big effort to get your pawn rather than just, uh, giving it away straight away. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So Keith went e5, trying to block things up, and you played at d5 here. And this is again typical of the examples Ray always gave to build this strong centre. And you can see this is like the same structure from the King's Indian defence as well. It's a similar thing. Exactly. Yeah. Obviously, Keith, Keith is a fantastically strong player, a very very practical player, and you can see positionally he's He's streets ahead of me, and he always will be. He knows, obviously, to put pawns on the black squares in the centre to make my white square bishop look a bit silly. And what he's hoping to do is stabilise the centre and then just pick off my c-pawn. Yep, yep. So um, let's have a look. So queen e7. Oh, attacking your uh, a3 pawn uh, there, I guess, as well. 
An F4. Wow. Whoa, getting those central, central pawns rolling. Excellent. I mean, f four's thematic in this sort of thing. Normally, after you've castled, you go playing F4. And obviously, when you play the Grandmaster, and there's lots of people watching, so it's on one of the top boards and things like this, I was very, very conscious of the fact that I could just lose this in a textbook example of how not to play as white, because if I lose A3 and then lose C4, everything just falls off and it's, I've just not got anything going whatsoever. So I, I felt, again, it's also with tempo, but I wanted to have a show of aggression before just everything fell apart on the queen side. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think it's very well timed, actually. It's quite surprising, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's very well timed, this one, because... Uh, Black's got to make a major decision. I mean, uh, either if Black plays d6, then, well, Black's no longer attacking a3, so um, that's great. And um, and then, yeah, and of course, you know, that queen on e7 is also vulnerable to, you know, knight g3 to f5 as well. So, um, um, yeah, if, if Black plays d6, then that queen e7 isn't justified. But, well, if Black's going to take on f4, then... Um, oh, Keith went for... Keith went for a3. My goodness. Oh, dear me. It's a brave player. A brave player, indeed. And you just... You when you're, in the position, when you're the He's just taking the money. <laughs> well, when you're, when you're the weaker of the two players by some distance and you're expected to lose, um, you know, from Keith's point of view, he's just tied it positionally, he's, he's picking off the pawns, and it can go very horribly wrong for White. So you can imagine my feelings at this point where maybe Keith's judgment is, is just so much better than mine. He knows he can take this pawn safely and I'm not getting anything for it which would be quite natural between two players of very, very different strengths. But on the other hand, you look at it now, I'm developed fully, okay, I'm a pawn down, I might even lose the C-pawn as well. But I have got this idea of pushing things on the king side, which uh, th there could be some easy moves for me to play. My G3, for example, has got two very nice squares on F5 and H5. And I could open the F-file any time I like. My queen can go to E1 and then to H4 or to G3 at certain moments. So even though... I suspected I could lose quickly just by things falling apart. I, I had this sort of conscious chance, if you like, of trying to get something going. Yeah, I mean, I think you've, uh, you know, you've actually done the, the, the difficult work uh, in a way. You know, I mean, you played this uh, this move, bishop f6, this nice early f4, and now it looks like you've got a period where um, your moves are, are going to come quite naturally, you know, because because um, um, some, some elements are yeah. going to develop naturally, and now it's Black's turn to, uh, well, to have to think and uh, think, you know, where, where are my pieces going to go? And um, I suppose, you know, just looking at it, uh, you know, when, when you just look at it like that and you think, well, that knight on a5, bishop on b7, you know, the, the, the black king's pretty, pretty empty, really. So um, it's it's not going to be that easy for, uh, for for black. So Keith gave a little... I would say if this game hadn't been played in 2000 and had been played this year, I would say you'd been influenced by alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Giving up material to get your kingside attack going. It must have been the other way around. <laughs> yes, Alpha Zero was influenced by you. Yes, I'll, I'll take that, that's fine. So, castles and knight g3. Oh, this is really nice, sir, Sean. So, so you didn't take that pawn on e5? No, I wanted to drift my piece into f5 and h5 as quickly as possible. Yeah. My queen now has access to g4, of course. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is really this is really nice. It's really, really good, really good play, uh, Sean. Wow. So Keith played g6. Ooh, ooh, and queen g4. Oh dear me, this is um, you're really starting to to have a sense of storm clouds gathering here. <laughs> this is uh... well, when you, when you're playing someone so strong, your first priority, I think, is not to lose quickly because it's embarrassing. Your friends are laughing at you and things like this. So. Once Keith's done two pawns in front of his king, uh, g6 and h6, all of a sudden I'm starting to get very nervous, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, first of all, I've not lost quickly. I've not lost straight from the opening. It, it's still alive. And if I was playing a weaker player, looking at this position now, I'd be thinking, wow, this is this really is fantastic. Yeah. But of yeah. course, Keith is, is, is very, very strong. Um, so can, can he defend? He's got a weakened king. His pieces are a bit offside. My attacking ratio is looking quite promising on the king side. Yeah, absolutely. So how did Keith try and do this? Rook e8. Ooh. Ooh, I suppose, yeah, maybe maybe Keith was looking to try and bring that queen back to f8, maybe, to defend. That's that's possible. It um, feels a little bit... Um, oh, feels a bit risky. And knight h5. Oh, my goodness. Nice move to play. Yeah, that's... Um, 
Oh dear, that's looking very, very uh, worrying now. Um, yeah, all sorts of moves, haven't you? Knight f6, f takes e5, f5. Yeah, and somehow black's, um, yeah, that c4 pawn turns out not to be important whatsoever, doesn't it? It's, um, and the knight on a5, bishop on b7 are still, uh, still really, um, kept out of play there. Um, it's rather strange because, in a way, because black took the pawn on a3 rather than targeting the c pawn, it's changed the whole dynamic of the, the whole system, really. Because he had to spend time getting his queen back from there, and c4, as I say, is still holding things together to some extent. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's uh, it felt like a three was the first one and c four would follow, but uh, but you've attacked so quickly that um, the black just hasn't had the time to um, uh, to organise anything. And then yeah, I mean then yeah, if black doesn't get that c four pawn, then then the knight on a five and bishop b seven, they're just dead wood, really, aren't they? It's um, yes. wow. This, this is actually this is a this is a, a very uh, a very beautiful attacking game. This so. Um, Keith played queen d6, covering the f6 square, and f takes e5, opening the f file. Yes. Mm, queen takes e5. Okay. <laughs> at, at queen takes e5, there was, there's a position here where obviously I could play knight to f6, forking the king on g8 and the rook on e8. And you wouldn't often get the chance against someone so much stronger than yourself to do a knight fork on two good pieces. But I must have felt very confident in that because I understood that the knight was so much stronger than the rook. Yeah. And there's been many, many times over the years prior to this game when I had really strong positions against really strong players. And you're thinking to yourself, what can they find from this position? What can they do? And nine times out of ten, of course, they find something that you just completely missed and they turn the tables quite quickly. Uh, but here, I was feeling very confident all of a sudden. So confident, in fact, that as used to happen in my games around about that time, if I was playing well against a strong player, my hand was starting to shake a little bit. And... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so nerves were taking their, um, making their, their presence felt a little bit around this stage. I bet. Um, let's have a look because you played, yeah, rook f5. Yeah, this is really, this is really good attacking technique. It really is. Keep your keep your attacking piece on h5. It's much better than that passive rook on e8, and uh, and just keep on. I mean, you're, you're doing everything with tempo. That's the amazing thing. You know, it's um, every move that you're playing is um, every strengthening move that you're playing for your attack is uh, is coming with tempo. So, um, I mean, uh, yeah, no wonder Black's uh, got such difficulties. It's just uh, it's just got no time to breathe. So queen e7 and rook f1. That looks good, doesn't it? it? Looks nice. God, that looks good. And you've also got e4 to e5 as well to activate that bishop on d3. I mean, it's really. I think you know every single piece is uh, is working for you there. Okay, so knight takes c4. Now on knight takes c4, Keith had a very very long think around here, and again I was wondering what what's he going to find, what's he going to do to review my attack. And of course, around about this time, as you know, lots of people start watching games like this. Uh, you've got my friends, you've got Keith's rivals who. Oh yeah. Perhaps want him to slip so they can make it easier for themselves, but there's so much tension in the air here, and you know this is this is real chess. This is um, what, what you want to play chess for. You want to be involved in a position like this, yeah. Even though yeah. it feels very tense at the time and very nervy, and with all your friends watching, the overriding thought in your mind is, please don't blow this. Please <laughs> don't blow, just blow things away. For example, the knight's heading to e3. If I'm not careful, which would be quite uh, nasty. Yeah, yeah. And to take the second pawn is, is a brave decision, but it does change the dynamic again because his rook now is opened up, for example, that can cause some problems later. And my, my pawn's not as stable as they were with that c pawn defending them. And I've got the question now do I want to get rid of my white squared bishop? I've been hoping to, to liberate that along the, the other diagonal. So it's, this is a quality player, Keith, defending here. He's, he's trying hard to change the trend of the game, which is very, very important, of course. Yeah, injecting some tension simply, you know, just um, uh, some new threats suddenly, uh, you know, from a position where you think, oh, I'm totally safe. There's some new things to uh, to look at, as you said, knight e3, knight d6, and um, and uh, and an open rook on the c file. And uh, yeah, it just shows, I mean, it's always the same, isn't it? With with chess, you always have to calculate at some moment. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, virtually never happens that you can just... Uh, you can just play beautiful moves and uh, positional moves and just win. It's uh, there's always a moment where you have to make that extra effort. And uh, let's have a look how you did this. So knight f6 check, king f8, bishop takes c4, getting rid of that knight. 
Rook C4, and Knight D7. Yeah, this, when, when Peter played Knight takes C4 after a long thing, I had to have a very long thing too, because it's so easy just to just not find anything. And for some reason, my calculation skills were working quite well that day, and I spotted this Knight takes D7 before I took the, the Knight on C4. And it just looks so incredibly strong. But I spent a long time just making sure that I wasn't missing something really obvious, like, you know, like a standard checkmate on the back line or something like this at the end of the complications. Yeah. But knight takes d7 is clearing the way for the rooks. I'm threatening queen takes g6 in some lines. It just looks so strong. It's fantastic. It. Yeah, not, not, not at all obvious. Uh, it's a very, very unexpected uh, capture, that one. So Keith went queen takes d7. And you come in with queen takes g6. My goodness. It's... Um... <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, it's really nice, actually. It's a completely unexpected angle of attack, I have to say, you know, because, uh, um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, just wouldn't have expected you to be taking on g6 with the queen like this, but um, very nice. So Keith's got a big problem on f7, of course. So yes. rook c7, queen h6 check. Yeah, this king is uh, king e7. Got to run. Queen f6 check, very important, yeah. Don't let the king run. Don't let the king escape to d8. King f8. And now this uh, this very nice move to finish things off. D6. D6 is a nice move. Yeah, so just queen h8, mate coming in, and yeah, there's just no way that he can, uh, that he can deal with this, um, um, with this threat. Just... Uh, Pieces in no shape to uh, to stop you coming into h8. It's it's very nice. It's very nice. I'll just say two more things about this uh, this game, or rather about the tournament. First of all, when you beat a strong player, you could expect any sort of reaction from them. I mean, for them, it's their living. They're they're trying to yeah get the prize from tournament to tournament, and obviously to lose in round two puts them up against it. But Keith's attitude immediately immediately after this game was absolutely fantastic. He resigned with a big smile and a very sincere handshake. Oh, lovely. And lovely. Yeah. And for the tournament, he spent a long time looking at my games, encouraging me. He was the very first person to congratulate me when I won the tournament. I won all five games. I was obviously buoyed up by this game. He made a big point of congratulating me personally. And we became friends. And he invited him to Teesside uh, to do some simultaneous displays just a few years after this. And he was fantastic with the children. Oh, he lovely. He's a good friend now. And this, this is what impresses me. This is another reason I chose this game, because I wanted to, to talk about Keith and how what a great sport he is. Um, he came second in the tournament. He won all his other games. But he wanted to congratulate me. And this made a big, big impression on me, because I'm sure we've all played players where we've beaten them up in a hoof and they're not particularly nice at taking things. Yeah, and, of course, we all want to win games. We all want to do our best. But, but this is the sort of thing that stays with me when, when you have an experience like this. It's my big moments, but he was willing yeah. to be part of that. It's so nice because it means you, you can enjoy um, winning the tournament on, on your chance when you win it. And yes. Yeah. That's the, really other, nice. the other aspect of this tournament was this was actually a qualifying tournament for the British Championship that year. And there were two places up for grabs. I, I got one, being the champion. And... I didn't take the place up eventually for various reasons, mainly financial. And the thing was, it was a really strong tournament this year. There was lots and lots of strong players there. There was David Walker, who was an FM, um, Richard Webb, I think is FM, if not IM. All sorts of people, and all the local ones as well. But there was a very young boy who came all the way uh, from London, I believe, to try and claim one of the places for the British Championship. And he did. And his name was David Howell. Oh! Uh. <laughs> he became the youngest person ever to qualify for the British Championship. Oh, yeah. And he did that by, he was never challenging for the top players. He was always sort of, you know, winning and then drawing and things like this. He was obviously a talented player, uh, but not quite the finished article. I think he was eight. <laughs> and he played in the very last round by beating my best friend. And <laughs> this, the Howell game against my friend Mike Kloss, who sadly died just a few years after that. Uh, he was my, my big friend. I miss him every single day. In fact, I have a memorial tournaments every year for, for Mike Kloss. Oh. And the thing with this, this was, the internet still wasn't the big thing it, it, it is now. So uh, newspaper columns were very important for relaying information. And the actual game between David Howell and my friend Mike Kloss was printed in lots and lots of newspaper columns. 
uh, because that took the headline rather than me winning this, which is fine, I, I don't mind, but the thing was I used to cut out these columns of Howell beating Kloss <laughs> and post them to my friend Mike. Oh, dear. <laughs> Here's another one, Mike. You know, you can stick this in the scrap button. You should be proud of this uh, this magnificent achievement. And of course, he never used to reply. <laughs> so, lots and lots of good memories of, of this this tournament, my opponents, and and to see young David Howell uh, qualifying. And of course, he's gone on to fantastic things. He's a superb player and a great example to us all. Oh. Thank you very much, Sean. That's a really good game. Um, and it's been really nice talking to you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you both very much indeed for, for this channel and this service and for inviting me along. Thanks very much, very Sean. Much.